Hello, we're glad you've joined us for today's keynote presentation, Prefrontal GABA Regulation of Cognition, Implications for Psychiatric Disorders. I am Christina Mahalik of Labroots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. To learn more, visit labroots.com. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CEE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. It is now my pleasure to present today's keynote speaker, Stan Floresco, PhD, Professor, Department of Psychology, University of British Columbia. Dr. Stan Floresco is a professor of psychology and member of the Brain Research Center at the University of British Columbia and a fellow of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. He received all of his postgraduate degrees from UBC, obtaining his PhD in 2000. He subsequently conducted postdoctoral research in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Pittsburgh, after which he returned to UBC to take up a faculty position in 2003. Dr. Floresco has published over 90 peer-reviewed articles on his research employing behavioral and neurophysiological approaches to study neural circuits within the dopamine system that facilitates higher order cognitive functions, such as cognitive flexibility and cost-benefit decision-making and how dysfunction in these circuits may relate to psychiatric disease. He currently serves as an associate editor, editor for the journals, Cognitive, Affective, and Behavioral Neuroscience and neuropsychopharmacology. And in 2010, he was awarded the American Physiolo uh, Psychological Association's Early Career Award. Dr. Floresco will now begin his presentation. Thank you, Labroots, for bestowing on me the honor of giving this keynote address and giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you today about some work my colleagues and I have been focusing on over the last five or six years or so, trying to understand how inhibitory transmission within the frontal lobes may regulate different aspects of cognition, and with a particular emphasis on how dysfunction within this system may relate to some of the symptomology we see in psychiatric disorders. Now, we initially started this line of research with an interest in schizophrenia and how dysfunction in the system may relate to schizophrenia symptomology. But the fact is, is that dysfunction within inhibitory GABA transmission in the prefrontal cortex may actually relate to a variety of different types of symptoms absorbed across different disease domains. Now, when one thinks of schizophrenia, one typically envisions what we refer to as the psychotic or positive symptoms, the delusions, the paranoia, the hallucinations, the voices people complain about. These are the symptoms we can see someone else suffering from. They make us feel uncomfortable. But there is, of course, a silent suffering associated with schizophrenia as well that takes a form of negative symptoms, impairments in motivation and emotional regulation, and in particular, impairments in cognitive functioning. Uh, this idea that schizophrenia is associated with cognitive disruption is not new. It dates back to some of the original descriptions of disorder by Pick and Kreplin, who originally labeled this syndrome dementia praecox, early dementia. 
Now, even though schizophrenia presents with both psychotic and these cognitive symptoms, there doesn't seem to be much overlap between them in terms of the mechanisms that may mediate these, because there doesn't seem to be any strong correlation between the severity of these two symptoms. You can have an individual who is very actively psychotic, but may also be high-functioning cognitively. And you can have other situations where a patient may have relatively subdued symptoms, but shows pronounced cognitive deficits. Now, the emphasis on cognitive dysfunction in schizophrenia really has turned up a lot in the last 10, 15 years because studies have revealed that cognitive functioning of an individual suffering from schizophrenia is his or hers best predictor of their long-term functional outcome. And those who show better cognition tend to perform better in the real world and they have a better prognosis. So they are more likely to be able to live by themselves and hold down a job compared to individuals who show poor cognitive functioning. So understanding the mechanisms that underlies the cognitive dysfunction we see in this disorder is a crucial first step in helping devise treatments that may ameliorate some of these deficits and improve the long-term outcome of the patients. So in terms of the mechanisms that underlie schizophrenia symptomology, there have been numerous hypotheses that have been put forth. Many of these focus on dysfunctions within certain neurotransmitters. So perhaps the most well-known and oldest hypothesis we have of what drives some of schizophrenia symptoms is what's referred to as the dopamine hypothesis, that there may be too much dopamine activity within certain brain regions within the schizophrenic patient. The key piece of evidence to support this is that all the drugs that we currently have that are effective at treating psychosis, treating these positive symptoms, block dopamine transmission, particularly the D2 receptor of dopamine, to some degree. And recent imaging studies have shown that individuals who suffer from schizophrenia show increased dopamine release in certain subcortical brain regions. So there is strong evidence to suggest that exacerbated dopamine transmission may contribute to at least some of the symptoms associated with schizophrenia. But the fact is, is that antipsychotics, drugs that block dopamine receptors, are relatively ineffective at treating these cognitive deficits and treating the negative symptoms. So dopamine may be driving more of these positive symptoms, but other neural abnormalities may be more related to the negative and cognitive symptoms we see in this disorder. A complementary hypothesis has been referred to as the glutamate hypothesis. Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and it is used by the principal neurons in the cerebral cortex and other key structures involved in cognition, such as the hippocampus. And there is some evidence to suggest that there may be deficient glutamatergic transmission within these brain regions that may underlie some of schizophrenia symptoms. For one, we know that if we give drugs that reduce glutamatergic signaling, particularly those that target the NMDA receptor subtype of glutamate receptors, that these drugs can induce both psychotic and cognitive symptoms that resemble what we see in schizophrenic patients in otherwise healthy individuals. And these drugs can also exacerbate these symptoms in patients diagnosed with schizophrenia. Furthermore, we know that if we look at postmortem brains of individuals who suffered schizophrenia, we see alterations and atrophy in neurons that use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. So what this figure down here is showing you is comparing what's referred to as a pyramidal neuron from the cerebral cortex of a healthy individual compared to a neuron that was taken from the brain of a schizophrenic subject. You can see there's considerable atrophy, and what this figure is showing you here is that there are fewer synaptic contacts in the neurons of uh, patients suffering from schizophrenia, suggesting that there may be reduced glutamatergic transmission that contributes to these symptoms. Now, this is, there's strong evidence to support this hypothesis, but yet another hypothesis that has been put forward is that there may be dysfunction within inhibitory GABA transmission within the frontal lobes. Now, GABA is the primary inhibitory transmitter in the brain. And within the cerebral cortex, this neurotransmitter comes from GABAergic interneurons, smaller neurons that are distributed throughout the cortex that serve as a major information filter for the frontal lobes and other regions. And these neurons are thought to regulate oscillatory activity, certain patterns of brain waves 
that underlie cognitive function. Now, there are numerous subtypes of these GABAergic neurons. One that has been studied very commonly are what are referred to as paravalbumin GABAergic neurons. They're labeled so because they contain the specific protein paravalbumin that is neuroprotective. And what I'm showing you in this diagram here is two examples of these types of PV interneurons. And one thing we know about these cells is that one individual GABAergic interneuron may send projections and make contacts with many different principal pyramidal neurons of the cortex. So that one individual cell may be able to regulate and inhibit the activity of up to 80 different pyramidal cells. So one cell has great inhibitory regulatory control over larger networks of prefrontal neurons. Now what we know from studies of postmortem brains of schizophrenics is that reductions in markers for these GABAergic neurons, particularly these parvalbumin neurons, is one of the most reliable pathologies that has been observed in the brains of schizophrenic patients. Studies from numerous groups around the world looking at different patient populations have repeatedly shown that there are reduction in these GABAergic interneurons within the prefrontal cortex of schizophrenic patients as well as other parts of the brain. So this is the first piece of evidence to suggest that GABA transmission may be dysfunctional within this disease. Other neurophysiological studies also add support to this idea. So as I told you before, certain types of cognitive functions that are mediated by the frontal lobes are associated with specific patterns of oscillatory activity, brain rhythms, that uh, facilitate certain types of cognitive functions. So when a healthy individual is performing a working memory task where they have to hold and manipulate information in mind for a brief period of time, that is associated with oscillatory activity in what's called the gamma range, where you see oscillations within the 40 hertz range. Well, patients with schizophrenia show impairments on these types of tasks and also show altered oscillatory activity. And we know that this oscillatory activity is driven by these GABAergic interneurons, suggesting that this alteration in behavior and brain rhythms may be due to dysfunctional transmission within the system. Now, one way that we can further understand how certain types of brain pathology may contribute to certain symptoms of a disease is by using animal models. And there have been numerous animal models that have been designed to induce some sort of insult in the brain that has some relevance to what may be going on in schizophrenia. Some of these models may involve genetic alterations, pharmacological, or neurodevelopmental alterations. Each of these models alter changes in the behavior that, in some regards, reflect what we see in patients with schizophrenia. But when we look at the brains of these animals, subject to these models, and look at the alterations that we see, one thing that is consistent across these different types of models is they all seem to target this inhibitory system within the frontal lobes. So genetic models that involve altering the genome of certain animals. In this example, this is a data using a DISC-1 knockout. DISC stands for disrupted in schizophrenia. It's a gene that has been identified in patients with schizophrenia. If we knock out this gene in animals and let them develop, we see impairments in cognition and behavior that resemble what we see in schizophrenia. And we also see a reduction in these pavalbumin, these PV GABAergic neurons, in the frontal lobes. What's more, if we use a pharmacological model, if we give a drug that blocks glutamate and MDA receptors, as I told you, these drugs can induce psychotic and cognitive symptoms in otherwise healthy individuals. We also see changes in behavior in animals that resemble what we see in schizophrenia when we give these same drugs. And these drugs also seem to reduce GABAergic transmission within the prefrontal cortex, causing a reduction in markers for these neurons, similar to what we see in schizophrenic patients. Neurodevelopmental models involve giving some sort of insult early in development, altering the tra trajectory of brain development. These models also change behavior like we see in schizophrenia. And again, one thing these manipulations seem to do is reduce the number of inhibitory interneurons 
within the frontal cortex. So when we look at all these pieces of evidence together, the postmortem studies from schizophrenic patients, the neurophysiological studies, and the work from animal models, they all lend themselves to a hypothesis is that perturbations in inhibitory GABA signal may lead to what some is referred to as a noisy cortex that can in turn impair cognitive functions mediated by the frontal lobes. Now this seems like a reasonable hypothesis based on what I've told you. But the truth is, until recently, there hasn't really been a lot of basic preclinical research designed to really isolate and identify what the contribution of inhibitory GABA transmission is in regulating cognition. What is its function? So that's what we've been interested in doing over the last few years. What are the consequences of reducing prefrontal GABA activity on different cognitive functions? That was our primary question. And as a secondary but important question is, when we do these types of manipulations, do the alterations in cognition that we see resemble impairments that we see in patients with schizophrenia? Or for that matter, patients with other types of psychiatric disorders. And so in this regard, preclinical studies with laboratory animals can help address these questions. So our basic experimental approach was rather straightforward. Rather than trying to develop a new model of the disease, trying to identify a different type of brain insult that may be relevant directly to what may be going on in schizophrenia. We've gone with a more basic research approach where we've assessed the effects of pharmacological reductions of prefrontal GABA transmission on different domains of cognition that we know are affected in schizophrenia. And in so doing, we used a very simple approach where we would infuse low doses of a drug that we know can reduce activity of GABA by blocking the receptor that it works on. And the drug we use is called bicuculin. And again, we're using small volumes and doses of this drug that don't induce any types of seizures, but just slightly disinhibit the activity within this cortical region. Now, in these studies, what we did to try to increase its translational value was try to pick particular tasks that measure different domains of cognition that relate directly to the types of tasks that are used in human subjects so that we may directly translate the findings we find with laboratory rats to what we see in patients with schizophrenia. And in picking these tasks, we tried to pick those that gave us richer patterns of behavior. So we could identify not just whether a certain manipulation impairs cognition, but look at the specific types of impairments that we see when we do this manipulation so that we can identify both qualitative and quantitative changes in behavior. So just because a manipulation may impair cognition, what we wanted to see is that does this manipulation impair cognition in the same way that we see cognition impaired in schizophrenia? Now, I want to emphasize that we weren't trying to model schizophrenia per se. We don't believe that this manipulation is a direct model because it has very low construct validity. Schizophrenia is not caused by someone infusing a drug in someone's brain, but rather what our primary focus on was to see how GABA regulates these different modes of cognition with the hope that understanding this can provide key insight into how dysfunction of the system may contribute to the behavioral abnormalities associated with this and other diseases that may be associated with dysfunctional GABA transmission. So, Cognition is a big word, and there are many different domains of cognition that are impaired in schizophrenia. In the early 2000s, the National Institutes of Mental Health started an initiative they refer to as the Measurements and Treatments of Research to Improve Cognition in Schizophrenia, also called the MATRIX. And the first part of this initiative was to bring together clinical neuroscientists, put them in a room, and have them hammer out and identify what are the specific domains of cognition that we reliably see are impaired in schizophrenia. And these seven domains were identified are listed here. Of these seven domains, speed of processing is one that refers to how slow or how rapidly 
uh, subject may be able to make a correct response on a particular type of task. I'm not going to talk about this domain directly, but what I will say is that in almost all the studies I'll be discussing today, one thing that we see is that when we reduce GABA transmission, animals are slower to make correct choices. They are more hesitant in trying to ascertain what the appropriate thing is to do. With respect to the other domains of cognition listed here, five of these we can test in animals. We still have not devised a test for verbal learning and memory to be used with the laboratory rat, but we're working on it. But of these remaining domains, I'm going to be talking about work where we've measured them for particular domains, attention, working memory, reasoning and problem solving, and spatial learning and memory. Now, many, but not all of these domains are mediated by the prefrontal cortex. And I say that because if we damage or inactivate the prefrontal cortex in humans or in animals, we see impairments in processes such as selective attention, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. So the first domain of cognition I'm going to talk about is attention. This is a fundamental deficit that patients with schizophrenia routinely complain about. They have difficulty maintaining focus. They are easily distracted by other stimuli. And one way we can assess this in experimental animals is by using serial reaction time tasks, where we flash a stimulus in one location in the environment for a very brief period of time, less than a second, and require the animal to tell us that it saw that stimulus and where it should go. So the way these tasks work is we place an animal in a certain chamber that has five apertures. And every five seconds or so, a light will flash in one of these apertures for a brief period of time, say half a second. And all the rat has to do is after we flash a light, the rat has to approach that particular location where the light was flashed. It has to stick its nose within that port and it's telling us, I saw the light. Now please give me a tasty sugar pellet. Now, studies by a number of groups over the last few years have shown that this aspect of attention is critically dependent on normal inhibitory transmission. What I'm showing you below in these graphs is studies from three groups showing that if you reduce prefrontal GABA transmission with a variety of different drugs, you get noticeable impairments in attentional accuracy, that animals are more likely to select the wrong aperture where the light was flashed, suggesting that they either didn't notice where the light was flashed or they thought it flashed in a slightly different location. And this assay is loosely analogous to the continuous performance test that is used in human subjects. And we see in patients with schizophrenia, they show impairments on these types of tasks. But one thing with this particular assay is that even though it tells you whether intention is affected or not, it doesn't necessarily get to the type of deficit that we might be seeing here. When an animal makes an incorrect response, is it because it didn't notice the light that was flashed, it didn't actually see it, wasn't paying attention? Or was it that maybe it thought the light flashed in a slightly different location? It didn't appropriately encode where that stimulus was. So one way we can get to that is by using a variation on this attention task. That is referred to as the sustained attention task. Here, we're just using one stimulus light that either turns on on some trials or doesn't. And what we do is we get the rat to tell us, did you see a light or not? So on these trials, we have what are called signal trials, where we flash a central light in an operant chamber for anywhere from 50 to 500 milliseconds. And after we flash that light briefly, we present the animal with two levers. And if we flash the light, and if the rat detected it, the rat has been trained to say that if I saw the light, I should press one particular lever. In this example, I should press the left lever every time I see the light. And this is registered as a hit, or a correct response. And if on these trials the animal presses the other lever, the right lever, that's an incorrect response, and it suggests that it may have missed a light, didn't see it, or what have you. Then we have, intermixed with these signal trials, non-signal trials, where no light flashes. And then after the absence of showing this light, we again present these two levers to the rat. And now the rat has to do something different. 
Now it has to press the opposite lever. Instead of the left lever, it has to press the right lever. And what it's telling us now is that you didn't flash me a light. So I'm pressing this lever so you, don't, you, so you can give me a piece of reward. And if it presses the left lever, the lever that is normally associated with what it should do when it sees a light, we call this a false alarm. Suggest that they maybe saw something that wasn't there. And what we found is that when we reduce prefrontal GABA transmission, like these other groups I've told you about, we also see impairments in attentional performance. When we look at what's referred to as their vigilance index, which is a, an index of their overall performance on both signal and non-signal trials, you can see that when we reduce prefrontal GABA transmission, animals show a marked decrement in performance compared to control animals, shown in the white arrow, right circles here. But then when we looked more closely at the types of errors and when they were making errors, what we found was that on the signal trials, on trials where we flashed them a light and they had to tell us, I saw the light, regardless of whether it was half a second long or 50 milliseconds long, there was actually no difference between the treatment conditions. So animals had no problem in detecting a stimulus that was there. Instead, what we saw was that reducing prefrontal GABA transmission caused a selective deficit in rejecting these tri on trials where the light was not shown. So we saw an increase in the number of false alarms, which was associated with a reduction in these correct rejection trials. So what this suggests is that GABA does play a role in regulating transmission, or re regulating attention, but it does so by selectively helping to filter out irrelevant stimuli. And when we reduce this transmission, we see this selective increase in these false alarm responders. And interestingly, this same type of task has been back translated for use with human subjects. And when this task was used with patients who suffer from schizophrenia, what they found was one of their attentional deficits was, as we saw here, an increase in false alarm responding. So there is some translational link between what we're seeing here and what's been observed in human schizophrenic patients. Working memory is another domain of cognition that is critically dependent on normal frontal lobe functioning as in, and is impaired in patients with schizophrenia. Working memory refers to a collection of cognitive operations that involve the short-term maintenance and manipulation of information in mind. And one key component of this function is being able to just hold bits of information in mind for a brief period of time. One way we can tap into that function is by using what are referred to as delayed response tasks, where a subject is given information it has to hold for a brief period of time over a delay and then use that information afterwards. And in an ocular motor delayed response task that's used with both primates and humans, the way this game works is on a given trial during a sample phase, we prevent the subject, we present the subject with a stimulus within one particular location. So on a screen, we'll present a dot in one particular location, and then after which there is a delay where no stimuli are presented. Then during the choice phase, what happens is now we present a number of different stimuli, and the subject has to orient his or her gaze to the same position where that stimulus was originally presented. And then a new trial starts, new information is given, and they have to continue on for hundreds of trials. Now, patients with schizophrenia show marked impairments on this type of task, as I'm showing you in this graph here. And one thing I want you to notice is that compared to healthy controls, patients with schizophrenia show an impairment in working memory, regardless of how long the delay is. So they show poor performance at short delays and poor performance at these longer delays. So this is a delay-independent impairment in working memory and suggests that this isn't so much a problem of remembering the information, but other problems associated with encoding that information and getting it into a buffer to remember. So we can test the same basic function in animals using an operant version of this delayed response task. Works in a similar manner to what I described to you before, 
is that we have a sample phase. Here we have a light illuminated above one of two levers, and then a lever is presented. The rat presses that lever for a brief period of time. That initiates a delay period where the animal has to wait anywhere from 1 to 24 seconds. And then during the choice phase, both levers are presented, both lights are illuminated, and we've taught the rat, press the lever opposite to the one that you press during the sample phase in order to get food reward. We find that if we make the cortex noisy, if we reduce inhibitory GABA transmission, we see a marked impairment in performance compared to control conditions, and like is observed in schizophrenia, this impairment in working memory seems to be delay independent, that animals show impairments in performance even at the shortest one second delay, and it doesn't seem to get any worse when delay increases. So we see, again, a translational, qualitatively similar type of deficit when we just reduce prefrontal GABA in the rat that we see with patients with schizophrenia. To compare, we also looked at what happens when we disrupt glutamatergic signaling within the frontal lobes, infusing a drug that blocks NMDA receptors, the same type of drugs that can induce psychotic symptoms and cognitive deficits in otherwise healthy individuals. Here, blocking glutamate transmission also impaired working memory, but the type of deficit was different. Here, animals actually were fine at the short delay, but it's only when these delays got longer did we see an impairment in performance. So here we saw a delay-dependent impairment in working memory, suggesting that glutamate transmission within the frontal lobes may regulate more mnemonic maintenance or retrieval of in short-term information. So when we look at these two findings together, what this suggests is that reduced glutamatergic signal, information coming from other sensory and other parts of the cerebral cortex that inform the prefrontal cortex and what it should remember. When that's combined with increased noise that may occur when we perturb GABAergic inhibition, may lead to what I refer to as a cortical cacophony, basically a hot mess of neural transmission, where signals that are supposed to be getting in saying what you should remember are blunted, and that's on top of a noisier baseline of excessive aberrant hyperactivity that may contribute to working memory deficits that we see in schizophrenia. Reasoning and problem solving is also impaired in schizophrenia. And in particular, certain forms of cognitive flexibility, having to adjust your behavior in responses to changes in one's environment. Now, in humans, this type of function is classically measured with assays such as the Wisconsin card sorting task, where human subjects are given decks of cards that have different shapes on them, different numbers of items on them, and these are different colors. And they are required to sort the cards by a particular stimulus dimension. So initially they may have to sort the cards based on the color, so put all the red cards together, all the blue cards together, all the yellow cards together. And then, unknown to the subject, the rule changes midstream. So now the subject has to sort the cards by shape, put all the triangles together, put all the stars together, put all the squares together. Now patients with damage to the frontal lobe and patients with schizophrenia are really bad at this task. They show market impairments on this. And in fact, impairments in cognitive flexibility is one of the most reliable types of cognitive deficits that have been observed in schizophrenia. Now we can tap to this same basic type of cognition, having to adjust how you discriminate and the strategies that you have to use to solve a problem using a simple task that we can use in rats in an operant chamber. So the way this task works, it's conducted over two days. And on the first day, we teach a rat a very simple rule. On any given trial, a light is going to be illuminated over one of the two levers. And what the rat has to do is press the lever that has the light illuminated above it. Sometimes it's on the left, sometimes it's on the right. And all it has to do is where you see the light, go to that, press the lever, and you'll get a tasty treat. Rats can learn this very easy, within 30 or 40 trials to get to a criterion of 10 correct choices in a row. The next day, however, we change the game. Now, the new rule is always press the lever within one particular location. So it might be always press the left lever. Now on these days, that light is still there. 
Sometimes it flashes on the left, sometimes it flashes on the right. And what the rat has to do is it has to stop using the old strategy, stop paying attention to this stimulus, which is now irrelevant, fit and figure out what the new strategy is. In this case, instead of looking at the light and where that position is, I should focus on the particular position of a lever and use that strategy in order to solve this task. Now, one reason why we like this particular task is we can look at the types of errors that animals make during the shift that can give us additional insight into how a certain manipulation may impair different components of cognitive flexibility. So what can happen on half of the trials is that the old rule and the new rule are in conflict. If we train the rat to always press the lever with the light above and on the old day, and then on the shift, now we teach the rat always press the left lever. On half of the trials, the light is above the right lever. And so when the rat presses the lever underneath the light on these trials, we refer to these as perseverative errors because they're persevering to using the old strategy. And we use these errors as an index of how readily animals learn to suppress using this old rule. But sometimes you'll have situations where the old and the new rule are congruent. So the light may be above the left lever, and today we're teaching the rat always press the left lever. Well, sometimes the rat's going to press a lever that doesn't have a light illuminated above it. And these are referred to as never reinforced or non-perservative errors. And we use these types of errors to ascertain how quickly the animal might be able to figure out the new rule to learn or establish this new strategy. Now, when we take a look at patients with schizophrenia and see how they perform on these types of tests, such as a Wisconsin card sorting test, what I'm showing you here is data from a study done in 2003. And what we see is that these patients, they make a considerable number of perseverative errors similar to what you see in patients with frontal lobe damage. So they keep harping on the old strategy. But they also make a considerable number of these non-perservative errors, suggesting that they also have problems in figuring out what the new strategy should be. So when we see how reducing GABA transmission within the frontal lobes of rats affects the same basic behavioral process, well, one thing we see is that if we make the cortex noisy, if we disrupt inhibitory transmission, when they're learning that first rule, when they're learning this simple rule, always press a lever with the light above it. We see no impairments in performance. Animals perform just as well as control animals. So you don't need normal inhibitory transmission to learn a simple discrimination rule. And this is important because it shows that this manipulation doesn't induce more gross or fundamental deficits in learning or motivational or other types of processes. But what we find was that when animals now have to change the way they behave, have to use a new rule and figure out what that rule is, that disrupting inhibitory transmission within the frontal lobes causes a market impairment in performance. And the type of impairment we see was dependent in part on when over the course of the learning sequence, we disrupted GABA transmission. So if we disrupted GABA transmission on the first day when they were learning the first rule, the next day when they had to shift, we observed that they were markedly impaired and showed these big perservative deficits. They kept using the old strategy, had great difficulty in figuring out what the new strategy was. Whereas if we disrupted GABA transmission on the day where they had to change their behavior, where they had to learn a new rule. Here, we see an increase in these non-perservative errors. Here, their big problem was trying to figure out what the new strategy was. In both of these situations, when you look at the combined effects, it recapitulates the type of deficits that we see in patients with schizophrenia that show both perservative and non-perservative deficits and suggest that dysfunction within GABA transmission during key aspects of learning may contribute to both types of deficits that we see in patients. Now, spatial learning and memory is a form of cognition that is very easy to assess in rodents. 
It's something that they are just built to do, is navigate through space and identify locations they should and shouldn't go to. And one way we can assess this in rodents is by using different versions of a radial arm maze task that involves a central hub with a number of arms radiating out of the center. And in this particular assay, which is sometimes referred to as the reference and working memory task, what we do is we bait four of the eight arms. Four of the eight arms contain little pieces of food. And it's the same four arms that are baited each day. And all the rat has to learn over about 20 or 30 days of training is just go down the arms that contain food and never go down the arms that have never contained food. Now, a well-trained rat can make two types of errors on this task. Sometimes it might go down an arm that has never contained food. And we refer to this as a reference memory error. This is a memory error for long-term stable information. It has learned over many days, never go here, there's nothing to see here. But every once in a while, they may enter these arms anyway. What can also happen, though, is sometimes a rat might go to an arm, take a piece of food, leave that arm, and then maybe a minute later, go back to that same arm. Just a little memory blip in terms of they forgot where they were a minute ago. And so we refer to these as working or short-term memory errors. So this distinguishes between information, memory errors for long-term stable information and more recently acquired label information. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that performance of this task in a rat that has been well-trained and knows this game does not require normal activity within the prefrontal cortex. That's what these data are showing you here. If we take animals, train them on this task, and then on a test day, shut down neural activity within the frontal lobes, basically completely inactivated, we see no significant impairments in either types of errors. So you don't need the prefrontal cortex to do this type of task. Other parts of the brain, such as the hippocampus, play a more cru crucial role in mediating performance on this task. But what we saw was that if we disinhibited the cortex, rather than shutting it down, when we made it noisy, we got a massive impairment in performance. And when we looked at the type of errors they made, we saw that animals made almost the same number of both reference memory errors and working memory errors. So they were just as likely to enter an arm that had never been rewarded as they were to enter an arm that they just visited maybe a minute ago. So this suggests that this is not so much a mnemonic deficit per se. It's not that they can't remember, but this reflects more of a disorganized search strategy. And it also suggests that a noisy prefrontal cortex, one that has been disinhibited and that we've induced aberrant patterns of excitation, may actually interfere with certain aspects of cognition that are not normally mediated by the prefrontal cortex. As I told you, this task does not need a normal prefrontal function. If we shut it down, rats can perform this task just fine. But when we make it hyperactive, aberrant activity flowing out of the prefrontal cortex may interfere with normal patterns of neural activity in other brain structures, such as the hippocampus that then lead to these impairments in search behavior. Now, another striking aspect of these data is that this qualitative nature of the impairment, the increase in both working and reference memory errors, is exactly what you see in patients with schizophrenia. So this task has been back translated for use with human subjects where they have to navigate through virtual space using a similar type of environment where we have a central platform and eight arms radiating out of the center. And subjects have to search and go down some arms to obtain money, and other arms contain nothing. And when you take a look at how schizophrenic patients perform on this task, you can see that they make a comparable number of both working and reference memory errors. So again, we see a qualitatively similar type of deficits when we just reduce inhibitory transmission within the prefrontal lobes to what we see in patients who have the full-blown disorder. So by now I hope to have convinced you, one, that 
inhibitory GABA transmission in the prefrontal cortex is crucial for mediating certain aspects of cognition. And when we disrupt this transmission, we see impairments in cognition that in many instances resemble what we see in patients with schizophrenia. But what about other symptoms? What about these positive symptoms we see? The hallucinations, the paranoia, the delusions. Could dysfunction in inhibitory GABA transmission relate to that as well? Well, we now know that these positive symptoms are driven to a large part by increased dopaminergic activity, as I mentioned near the beginning of the talk. This likely is to be a major contributing factor to the positive symptoms. One reason we say this is because if we take patients with schizophrenia and give them a pharmacological challenge, we see that patients tend to have much higher levels of dopamine release compared to healthy controls. And the magnitude of this increase in dopamine release is positively correlated to the positive psychotic symptoms they display. So when they see greater levels of dopamine release, they also tend to see greater levels and intensity of these psychotic symptoms. Now, how might the frontal lobes be regulating this? Well, one thing we know anatomically speaking is the prefrontal cortex sends direct and indirect projections to the dopamine neurons in the midbrain. These projections are excitatory. So we could envision a situation where is that if we were to cause hyperactivity within the frontal lobes, might this contribute to hyperactivity within the dopamine system as well? So we address this issue with both behavioral and neurophysiological means. In one experiment, we looked at how these manipulations affected sensitivity to the psychomotor effects of amphetamine. Amphetamine increases dopamine transmission, causes an increase in general locomotor activity, and is a standard assay that is used to validate many different models of schizophrenia in animals. We know that patients with schizophrenia, that drugs like amphetamine can exacerbate their positive symptoms, and they may show just general sense, increased sensitivity to the psychomotor effects. Well, we found that when we disinhibit the prefrontal cortex, we found that animals were much more sensitive to the locomotor effects of amphetamine, suggesting that we have somehow turned on or amplified the sensitivity of the dopamine system. And what's more, when we recorded the activity of dopamine neurons and how often they fired and the pattern that they fired, we found that when we disinhibited the prefrontal cortex, we saw an increase in the burst firing and the overall activity of these dopamine neurons, suggesting that in addition to regulating these different aspects of cognition, if we reduce prefrontal GABA functioning, this may contribute to the hyperdopaminergic functioning and potentially some of the positive symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia. Now, how do we measure those positive symptoms in rats? How do we, well, with Hallucinations, we can't really get to that. What does a hallucinating rat hallucinate about? Little cats meowing, other rats squeaking, Iggy Azalea, I don't know. We may never know. But another component of schizophrenia are these delusions. And one component of that seems to be that patients with schizophrenia have problems in discriminating between different stimuli that may either be emotional, emotionally salient, things that are important, things they should pay attention to and deal with, versus other stimuli that are otherwise benign and neutral. So the way I describe this to my students is if I'm walking across the street and someone looks at me in a funny way, I can probably attribute that to a number of other reasons and not pay too much attention to that. So why are they looking at me? Well. Maybe they recognize me, or maybe it was just a random glance. Maybe I have mustard on my face. Maybe I'm just really good looking today. I don't know. But I can let that go. But the individual with schizophrenia will see someone staring at them and will aberrantly tag that stimulus, saying, oh, this is important. Why are they looking at me? And then they start to build a narrative. Well, they're looking at me because maybe they're with the CIA. Maybe they're after me. Maybe they can read my mind. And so this aberrant salience attribution can contribute 
to the delusional states associated with the disorder. Now that we kind of can get to in studies with laboratory rats. One way we can do that is we can use what's called a discriminative fear conditioning procedure. Now, fear conditioning tests are used very commonly to look at emotional learning in animals, where we pair some stimulus, a sound, with a shock. And when you pair that shock, when you play that sound, animals will show a fear response. So in this assay, what we can do is we can teach the animal that if you hear one sound, that's associated with shock. And it learns that this particular sound means something bad is going to happen. But we can also teach it when we play another sound, a completely different sound, nothing happens. Nothing good, nothing bad. This is just a meh sound, and I shouldn't worry about it. And then what we can do is take the animal and put it in a situation where it has to actively engage in behavior. So it might be pressing a lever for reward. And when we play that sound that was never associated with shock, it will keep pressing that lever. It won't care. It's like, this shock, this, this tone, tone doesn't mean anything to me. But when we press that tone that was associated with the shock, animals stop pressing for food. They stop reward seeking. They realize, oh, something bad might happen. They go into behavioral arrest. So it evokes this particular fear response. And so animals can be pretty good at learning when to show a fear response to one stimulus and when not to care, when not to be show any emotional response to another stimulus. So using this procedure, what we found was that in control animals, animals that were just treated with an infusion of saline, we saw very good discrimination. What this graph is showing you is how much they suppress their ongoing reward seeking when we play the two tones that were either associated with shock or not. And you can see that when we play that shock tone, the one that was associated with shock, Animals show a lot of suppression of their behavior. And when we played the tone, the neutral tone, that was not associated with anything good or bad, it doesn't really affect their behavior that much. Well, what we saw was that when we reduced prefrontal GABA transmission, we got a marked deficit in this ability to effectively attribute sanes. Here, animals showed less fear to the tone they should be scared of, the one that they were showed shock, and what's more, they showed greater fear to the tone that was neutral, to the tone that wasn't associated with anything bad. So they showed a more generous stimulus generalization, whereas they couldn't attribute which is the tone that is important, that is emotionally salient to me, versus which is the stimulus that I shouldn't worry about and I shouldn't pay any attention to. So it suggests that normal GABA transmission is involved in discriminating between emotionally salient and neutral events. But what was so striking about these findings to us is that this pattern of deficits we see when we reduce GABA transmission is exactly what has been observed in schizophrenic patients, put on the same type of task. And what you can see here is that control subjects, like we see in our rats, show a greater fear response to a stimulus associated with shock versus nothing whereas patients with schizophrenia show much poor discrimination. So it suggests that dysfunction in GABA transmission may not just contribute to the impairments in cognition, but may also contribute to some of the delusional aspects of the disorder. Lastly, I want to talk about the negative symptoms a bit, because this is a domain of cognition that really has not been studied as much in animals. And one of the key negative symptoms that is associated with schizophrenia is avolition, this lack of drive to perform activities or pursue meaningful goals. And this avolition may be mediated in part by impairments in evaluating the relative costs and benefits associated with different behaviors or actions. And we can test this in both humans and animals using certain types of effort-related decision-making tasks. And so one way you can test this in humans is you can give them a choice between two options that may yield them different magnitudes of reward. So if you, you can give them the choice where if you press one button 20 times with the index finger of your dominant hand, you might get $1. Whereas if you press another button with the pinky finger of your non-dominant hand, 
Now you might get a larger reward, anywhere from three to seven dollars. So if you work a little harder, you might get more of a reward. And these types of studies have been done in patients with schizophrenia. And relative to healthy controls, what they find is those patients, they choose the easier option. They're less likely to work harder to obtain a larger reward compared to normal healthy control subjects. And what's more is they found that these effects, this reduced motivation and impaired cost-benefit evaluation was greatest in patients that showed the more elevated number of negative symptoms. So it suggests that this avolition and impairments in cost-benefit decision-making may relate to this negative symptomology. Well, these types of studies in humans were actually translated from original studies that were done in rats to measure these same processes. And so an assay we can use to get to this aspect of decision-making is shown here, where here, again, we give the animals a choice between two options. If it chooses the high-reward option, it has to press a laser anywhere from 2 or 20 times to get a larger four-pellet reward. Whereas if it chooses another option, the low reward option, it only has to press it once, but here it gets a smaller reward. So do you want to work a little harder to get a bigger payout, or do you want to go lazy and just choose the smaller reward? What we found was that when we disrupted prefrontal GABA transmission, like has been observed in schizophrenic patients, these rats became a little lazier in terms of they did not want to work as hard to get that larger reward. But we saw these effects primarily when they had a strong bias for that large reward to begin with. So when the effort requirement was relatively low, when they only had to press two or five times to get that large reward, when we made the cortex noisy, it dragged them down a little bit. Whereas when they just showed a stronger preference for the easy option, we didn't see any additional exacerbation in performance. So this was an indication, hey, yeah, when you disrupt prefrontal GABA signal, we may see motivational deficits as well. So whenever we do these types of studies, we do some key control tests to see, well, is this manipulation just impairing their ability to discriminate between larger and smaller rewards, irrespective of any costs that may be associated with that? So we did a control experiment where we had animals just, now there's no effort requirement, just choose big reward versus small reward. All things being equal. And what we found here was this annoying little effect where even under these simple situations, animals just showed a slight reduction in preference for that bigger reward. I mean, they still showed a strong preference. They're still choosing that bigger reward maybe 80% of the time, but it was just a little bit smaller than what they did under control conditions. And then we did a more formal array of studies where now we varied the discrepancy between the large and the small reward, where now they're choosing between six versus one pellets, four versus one pellets, two versus one pellets. In every situation, we see that just making the cortex a little noisy just impairs the reward valuation process just a bit. So they just like these smaller rewards a little bit less, or are less likely to maintain focus on that larger reward, more likely to slip and just sample this smaller reward. And so, okay, well, maybe they just can't tell the difference between the left and the right lever. Maybe we've got some general impairment and discrimination. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. Because if we give them an even simpler situation, press one lever to get two pellets versus another lever to get zero pellets, here, there's no impairment in performance. So what this suggests is that disrupting GABA transmission doesn't just affect cost-benefit decision-making, but may induce a subtle but more general impairment in reward valuations. So if they have to choose between something versus nothing, there they can do that just fine. I will choose a lever associated with reward versus nothing. But that when they have to choose between something good versus something better, Disrupting GABA transmission kind of interferes with this math and this valuation, and they're just a little less likely to choose the better option. And this may also underlie certain motivational deficits that we see in schizophrenia and other conditions 
that may be associated with GABA transmission. So just to summarize what I've talked about today, what I hope to have convinced you is that reducing prefrontal GABA transmission in animals induces abnormalities in cognitive function, dopamine transmission, emotional regulation, and reward valuation. And in many instances, the abnormalities that we see in animals are qualitatively similar to what we see in schizophrenia. So we see impairments in attention, working memory, spatial learning and memory, and cognitive flexibility. We also see increased dopaminergic activity and aberrant salience attributions, and also certain negative symptoms related to motivation. And so these abnormalities, when we look at what we see in our preclinical models and what we look at the symptom clusters, it suggests quite strongly to us that these cognitive and behavioral abnormalities associated with schizophrenia may be driven in part by alterations in perturbations in inhibitory GABA transmission in the frontal lobes. And ultimately what I hope to have shown you here is that the use of preclinical translational assays may provide penetrating insight into the mechanisms underlying abnormal behavior and cognition associated with psychiatric disorders. And with that, I would just like to thank key members of my research staff that were involved in conducting these data, including Takeshi Animoto, former postdoc who started these studies, my long-term technician, Merrick C, two of my graduate students, Patrick Piantidosi and Megan Oshie, and talented undergraduate, Madeline Schilt. And with that, I would be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Floresco, for your informative presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Floresco will answer as many questions as time permits. So without further ado, let's hop into questions with our first one. Uh, Dr. Floresco, our first question of the day asks, are there any behaviors that do not appear to be affected by reducing GABA transmission the way uh, they are affected in schizophrenia? I've been emphasizing all the behaviors where we do see some change that resembles schizophrenia, but it's not everything. I don't want to say that this is the only thing that may be driving symptomology. And certainly, uh, other forms of cognitive flexibility and discrimination learning uh, that I didn't discuss, such as reversal learning, where animals now don't have to change the strategy that they use, but they simply have to change a particular stimulus they approach. These types of processes are subtly impaired in schizophrenia, but when we disrupt prefrontal GABA transmission, we don't see an impairment in this type of executive functioning. So if we teach a rat just to always press the left lever and then teach it to always press the right lever, disrupting inhibitory transmission within the prefrontal cortex doesn't seem to be affecting that behavior. So there certainly are other aspects of behavior that may be disrupted through other systems. What we're trying to say here is that dysfunction within this particular system, this prefrontal inhibitory system, may be one of the drivers for many, but not necessarily all of the symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia. Thank you, Dr. Floresco. Thank you so much for your answer. Our second question asks, based on your findings, is there any evidence that drugs that enhance GABA transmission could be effective for treating symptoms of schizophrenia? Compounds that initially showed some promise, but then upon further study didn't. Now, the idea of targeting the GABA system directly is very tricky because GABA is everywhere in the brain. We certainly have drugs that can enhance GABA transmission, like benzodiazepines, drugs like Valium, that are used to treat anxiety and at higher doses can become sedative. These drugs by themselves are not particularly effective at treating the cognitive dysfunction, but part of this may be simply because there you're just causing a general reduction in activity. So I think the trick is, and moving forward, is finding a way to normalize rather than just reduce or enhance GABA transmission within these particular synapses where we may be having aberrant 
hyperactivity or reduced GABA transmission. Now, there may be other ways of getting to that. One thing we know that dopamine transmission does within the frontal lobes is that it can enhance GABA activity. And we actually have some data to suggest that impairments in working memory that, that we see when we disrupt GABA transmission can actually be ameliorated if we enhance dopamine transmission within the prefrontal cortex. So I think moving forward, it's helping to identify which synapses what, and the types of receptors that these synapses may have where GABA is deficient. And maybe rather than giving drugs that just enhance GABA transmission globally, finding a way to more preferentially target these receptors, perhaps using partial agonists or stabilizers uh, for these types of transmission. Thank you, Dr. Floresco. Uh, it appears we only have time for one remaining question today. That question is, what are other disorders that may be the result of faulty inhibitory transmission in the frontal lobes? As I told you at the beginning, our interest in this was stemmed by our interest in schizophrenia, but two other disorders where uh, you can see similar types of symptoms, it certainly at least was some domains, uh, are autism and certain aspects of depression. So certainly there's been uh, an increased focus on how uh, deficient GABA transmission may contribute to some of the symptomology we see in, uh, in autism. And certainly certain parts of the frontal lobes in depression seems to show this aberrant hyperactivity, which may also be mediated by uh, dysfunctional GABA transmission. And so you can look at these three diseases, autism, schizophrenia, depression, they present quite differently, but they all may have some symptoms that are in common. And so I think as the field is moving forward, there's this whole notion of this uh, research domain criterion where rather than identifying a disorder by labeling it a certain name, focus on the symptoms of that disorders and try to understand commonalities in the neural dysfunction across those symptoms. And so across these different disorders, when we see these same symptoms, they may be, at least in some instances, driven by the same type of pathology, in this case, deficient inhibitory transmission. I would like to once again thank Dr. Floresco for his keynote presentation today. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to leave with us? I'd just like to thank you again for the opportunity. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and thank LabRoots for today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. I'll see you next time here at LabRoots.com. Goodbye.